Uh, my talk will be about uh, distributed computing, <coughs> some foundations of distributed computing, and um, basically the role of knowledge in understanding, analyzing, and designing a protocol for distributed computing. So <coughs> I'm going to start with some tutorial or background talking about the connection between indistinguishability, knowledge, and the role in distributed computing. Then I'll give you a crash course on how to model knowledge in distributed computing. I'll present what I call the knowledge of preconditions principle, which is a connection between knowledge and action. And I'll present some uh, applications uh, of how this approach to thinking about distributed or multi-agent systems uh, can be used. I have many slides. I'm probably not going to go over all of them, and I appreciate questions. So please feel free. Um, hopefully, at the end of this talk, you should all know what knowledge of preconditions means. And if you don't, and you haven't asked, then your fault. Great. OK. So I want to start by example, considering a very simple uh, problem. We have a network of several interconnected sites. So think of them as agents, or processes, or nodes. Uh, in this case, each one of them starts out with some number. And we want to compute the maximum. So what does computing the maximum mean in this case? If you look carefully, you'll see that uh, agent one on the left has an, <coughs> a sophisticated device called a printer, 1992 or something. And she needs to print one number, and that number should be the maximum. OK, so computing the maximum means having process one, agent one, print the maximal value. OK? Now, suppose that the first step that happens is <coughs> that agent 2 sends her value of 100 to agent 1. So now agent 1 has the maximal value. And the question is, can she print it? OK, she, she's seen the maximal value. Can she print it? And the answer is, no, OK, good. And why not? Well, even though <coughs> she's seen the maximum, she considers it possible that 100 is not the maximum. There's another scenario in which she starts with 75. She receives a message with 100 from her neighbor. And in fact, the maximal value is 200. OK. So I mean, this is not surprising. Um, obviously, she hasn't collected all the values. So how can she print the maximum? So one thing to notice is that you don't really need to collect all values in order to print the maximum. Not always. For example, we could have a protocol going from right to left, collecting just the maximal value that would, <coughs> whose last message would be, Two, sending the same message with a value 100 to 1, after which uh, the maximum could be printed. OK, so you don't really have to collect all values. Uh, what's interesting is that it's not always enough to collect all the values. OK? How could that be? Well, th it really depends. I mean, this is. The statement is true, uh, but it's partly because I haven't defined things uh, sufficiently. But for example, if <coughs> agent one doesn't know if there are four or five members in uh, the network, she could have all the values of all these four and consider it possible that there's actually a fifth node with a larger value. OK? So what we have is that computing the maximum in this example, which is kind of a 
vanilla distributed computing uh, task uh, is not about collecting values. What is it about? Well, what we've seen is <coughs> that what's really important here is the indistinguishability. If there's an indistinguishable state at which I can't perform an action, then I can't perform it here. Okay? So the, an essential aspect of distributed computing is that a process has to take the same actions as indistinguishable points of computation. Your action is actually a function of your local state. You're following a protocol. So when you're in the same local state, you have to perform the same action. And in the examples we saw, if you would print in uh, print 100 in one case, you would also print it in the indistinguishable other case in which it would be a mistake. OK? So this is the, so indistinguishability is, in fact, a fundamental notion in distributed computing. Uh, essentially, all impossibility results, all lower bounds, uh, are based on indistinguishability. So, uh, <coughs> in now, we'll go and look at a few pictures, and in all of our pictures here, we're going to have executions going from left to right. So time will be going from left to right. Each one of these lines is a complete history of the execution. Okay, and the point of this slide is to say that the same agent, the same process might have the same, or a given process might have the same local state at different points of different execution. Okay, and <coughs> if uh, there's an indistinguishable, so these are called indistinguishable points, okay? These two points are indistinguishable to this process. And if there's an indistinguishable uh, point at which the maximum is not a given value C, then at this point, process one can't decide on the value C. C, in, in our examples before, was 100, but it can be anything else. Now, we've just had lunch. And uh, it's a difficult time, but you are very quiet. Too quiet. And with my jet lag, you know, if I fall asleep too, then we'll be in trouble. OK. So uh, <coughs> fine. So I can't decide, I can't print C if there's an indistinguishable point in which the maximum is not C. When can I print C? Well, exactly if this does not happen, OK? That is, if, if the dual situation happens, the maximum at the current point is C, and also at all indistinguishable points, the maximum is C. Okay, then that means my local state guarantees that the maximum is C, and in this case, we're going to call it <coughs> process one, agent one knows that the maximum is C. Okay? If, if I know that the maximum is C, I can print C when my task is to print the maximum. Okay? And that's the... Well, I don't know what you think initially. But if you're at a point where you think that the maximum is 100 or 78, and in all executions of the protocol where you have the same information, it must be 78, then you know it's 78 and you can print it. So C, gets updated. C does not get updated. I mean, C, C is true for all values, but you will only know that one of them is the maximum and only when you've collected enough information. OK, so for any C, once you know that the maximum is C, you can print it. The, the, the values themselves did not change. It's your information about the world that changes when you get more messages. OK? So <coughs> basically, here's an example where 
we see how the, our task was to print the maximum. In fact, it reduces to knowing what the maximum is. Okay? It's necessary to know that the maximum is C in order to print C, and uh, intuitively it's also sufficient. So the computing the maximum actually reduces to reaching a point where you know what the maximum is, and then you perform the one more, the additional step of printing it. Now, knowing that the maximum is C is, is a you know, natural or an intuitive thing, but it can depend on many things. It can depend on the signals you receive. It can depend on the protocol. We saw that you know, in the, the bottom-up protocol, when process 1 receives the message from process 2, she knows that that message uh, contains the maximum, where if the protocol is different, she doesn't. It can depend on what you know about the possible initial values. If the values are all grades in a course, and you've seen 100, you know you can print 100 because nothing is going to be larger later. You're not going to see a larger value, and there isn't a larger value. If you know what you know about the network topology affects your information, what guarantees you have about uh, the timing of communication affects uh, your knowledge the possibility of failure. So there are lots of, of different um, factors that figure into when you know the maximum. But still, computing the maximum is really reaching, guaranteeing that you reach a point where you know what the maximum is, and then you print it. OK. So I'm going to try to take that example and generalize it. And uh, I'll start from the fact that uh, <coughs> problem specifications in distributed systems, I mean, problems are presented by specifications. You know, we have requirements that we have to satisfy. And they typically impose conditions on when actions can be performed and what actions should be performed under certain conditions. So for example, we could imagine an ATM automatic teller machine at a bank to have as one of its, uh, part of its specification could be that I should receive 100 <coughs> Singapore dollars only if I have good credit in my account. Okay? So that's a, a necessary condition that the ATM should not give me money if I don't have good credit. Um, in an agreement protocol, we have lots of uh, constraints, but a, an example of a constraint would be that a process I should not decide on a value V, <coughs> or should uh, a necessary condition for deciding on a value V is that no one is going to decide on a value that's not V. Okay, that's agreement. That's called the agreement. Uh, condition. Um, we could imagine an autonomous car satisfying the requirement that you can only enter an intersection if the intersection is free. There's no cross traffic. Okay, so essentially um, problems are given via specifications which relate uh, actions to various conditions about the world. In computing the maximum, the condition was that you should only print a value C if the maximum is C. And what we've seen is that you should only print a value C if you know that the maximum is C. Okay, so look, these two things are very similar. But if you're <coughs> all uh, protocol specifications, I mean, typically they don't talk about knowledge, but in this particular problem, this condition actually gave us that you can only print the value if you know that it is the maximum. Okay? So, 
I want to claim that, in fact, this is a there's a much more general property going on. And this is what I call the knowledge of preconditions principle. And we said nobody leaves without. <coughs> OK. So uh, the knowledge of preconditions principle in this kind of terminology says that if some condition about the world, phi, is a necessary condition for performing the uh, action alpha. We had all these examples of ATM, agreement, etc. Then uh, <coughs> knowing phi is a necessary condition for performing alpha. OK? So this, I claim, is a, an essential connection between knowledge and action. And it's not just an idea. It's not just an intuition. It's a theorem. So we're going to prove it. OK, so there is a theory of knowledge in distributed systems that's been going on for effectively over three uh, decades. And uh, this is the start of the crash course on the theory of knowledge in distributed computing. You've already seen half of it. Um, so the basic notion is indistinguishability. So we say that two points in different executions are indistinguishable to process i if i has the same state, the same local state, at both. OK, and think of the, the protocol is a function of your local state. In our example, when we had an indistinguishable point with a maximum was not 100, printing 100 was not allowed. OK, so now we say, <coughs> consider a point. And imagine, so here we have all these, we have four different, or five, sorry, five different runs in this picture. And they're supposed to symbolize all runs of your application. You're, you're written a protocol, a program. This program has executions. And <coughs> that's the set of all executions. And here in this picture, these are all the points that are indistinguishable from this particular point, which is, you can think of some time t in the run r. <coughs> if a fact, particular fact phi is true at all of them, this could be x equals 0, it could be the maximum is 3, this could be the intersection is empty, or whatever. If <coughs> phi is true at all indistinguishable points, all points that are indistinguishable from this point, then we say that at this point, i knows phi. So that they are indistinguishable to i. This i here on the edges means i cannot distinguish. Process i does not distinguish between these points. So that's, we saw that in the example. This is now the definition in pictures. And you can actually. So it'll be a little more formal. Uh, a run is an infinite sequence of global states. Um, a system is a set of runs. A run is a history of a computation. A system is a set of runs. Typically, the set of all runs of your application in your model of computation. And we assume that every global state in a run determines a local state for each one of the players, for each one of the processes. And <coughs> now uh, we can define a logic of knowledge um, where facts are going to be assumed or uh, be considered, defined to be true or false at a given point. And we're going to write it this way. We're going to write. Here, uh, this would mean that at time t in the run r, with respect to our system, so we have a set of runs, uh, the runs of our protocol in the background. So at time t in the run r, phi is, <coughs> uh, phi is satisfied, means phi is true at the point rt with respect to this system. So now we can define a logic. and. I won't do it. We can go back to it. You have all the slides. 
Uh, but there's one clause in this uh, definition which is actually exactly what we saw in the picture. And it says that at the point RT, I knows phi exactly if at, at all points of the system that are indistinguishable to I from RT, so where the local state of I at time T is the same as it was in the run R at time T, phi is true. So, so what this is, this is formal words for the pictures we had. The definition of knowledge here is in words what we saw in the picture before. What's important at this point, and this is the end of the crash course on how to define knowledge. So <clears throat> one thing to notice it, is that this definition completely ignores the complexity of computing what you know. Okay? Your local information is identified with your local state. And uh, we say that you know a fact phi if phi is guaranteed to hold given your local information, given your local state. That's what this definition does. OK? And uh, one important point to notice is that this definition is model independent. It doesn't matter if, you know, what your system is. It could be a system of robots. It could be an asynchronous system, a synchronous system. You could be communicating by uh, message passing or by writing into variables, uh, etc. So this definition, uh, I'll, I'll come to you in one second. Uh, as long as you can define the set of all possible runs of your application, and you can identify in every run a local state for each agent, this definition applies. Yes? Is there a notion of timing? There's an external notion of time. That is, it's not something that the processes necessarily have access to, but we, modeling the system, we consider the history and we consider the states of the system in this history. A run, okay, so there is a notion, but it's a notion for the purpose of analysis. And it's not, I mean, there, there will be systems in which there are clocks and the processes will know at time seven that the time is seven, and there'll be other, si other systems where, yes, your local state does not tell you what the time is, so you don't know. But we, from the outside, we say, oh, at time seven, you haven't received a message from Rachel yet. So uh, you, know, you don't know the content. OK? So good question. Thank you. <coughs> OK. So remember, we mentioned that problems are presented by way of specifications. And uh, what we want to claim uh, is that specifications impose constraints on the knowledge of the agent. So we do that by proving the knowledge of preconditions principle. I'm going to write, I mean, uh, this is just going to be a fact saying that I is performing the action alpha. OK, so excuse the, the notation. That's the definition of does I alpha means I is now performing the action alpha. And the knowledge of preconditions theorem says under minor assumptions about alpha and possibly about phi, what we want to prove is that if phi is a necessary condition for I performing alpha in R, which means whenever I performs alpha, phi must hold, then I knows phi is also a necessary condition for performing alpha. OK? That's the knowledge of precondition principle as a theorem. There are a couple of versions. So I'm going to prove one of them, the slightly simpler one. I'll say that an action alpha is deterministic in a given system if whenever you perform it at some point of some run, and there's another point that's indistinguishable to this process i from the original, then i will perform alpha there as well. OK? 
Okay, that's the definition of the OSS. Assume that your action is a function of your local state. We say that the action is a deterministic action. And now, uh, so, so alpha is deterministic. This is words for that picture. And uh, the theorem now will be, suppose that alpha is a deterministic action for process I in your system. Okay, uh, an example where all actions are deterministic is if you have a deterministic protocol and uh, say everyone moves at every step. So uh, I want to show that if phi is a necessary condition for performing alpha, then ki phi is also a necessary condition. It took me 30 years to write down this uh, theorem and to, uh, to prove it. So I'm glad we have you know, uh, 90 minutes for the, uh, the proof will be three lines. Uh, so suppose that alpha is deterministic. I performs alpha here. What do I want to prove? I want to prove uh, that if phi is a necessary condition for doing this, then ki phi is as well, right? That's, that's the purpose. I want to show that <coughs> assuming, again, assuming that phi is a necessary condition for performing alpha, I want to show that ki phi is a necessary condition for performing alpha. So assume that phi is a necessary condition for performing alpha, that I performs alpha here. So <coughs> uh, let Consider another point which is indistinguishable to I from this point. Because alpha is deterministic, it's performed at the other point in the run R prime as well. Because phi is a necessary condition for performing alpha, I mean, you can only give me money, the ATM will only give me money if I have credit. I must have credit here. Phi must be true here. So what we've seen is that at all points that are indistinguishable from the original point, phi must be true. And therefore, I knows phi. End of proof. OK? That's it. Um, yeah, 30, 30 years of work. OK. So. Uh, the, the point here is really that the knowledge of preconditions principle says, even though all the specifications you've seen all your life, not all, some talk, talk about uh, privacy, and then they talk about someone should not know something, but typically they say, you know, you should only do something under certain conditions, and uh, it's all about what should happen in the world. What this theorem says is that that all induces conditions on what you must know when you act. OK? And I want to show that, uh, yes? When, when, you, you know, when you introduce the theorem, it says under minor condition. And of course, the so the minor condition in this case was deterministic. Okay. And there's another one that would apply for asynchronous systems. And we can talk about it, but that would be a six line one more line of definition and three more lines in the proof. But the, the idea is, well, you know, I, I have to perform the same thing at indistinguishable points. And if phi has to be true whenever I perform it, phi must be true at all indistinguishable points. That's what's going on here. OK? <clears throat> so the, I showed you all the, the conditions for the theorem that I proved. So it's not that, OK? And now the point is that this, is a, this theorem applies in all Distributed system. Your system could be uh, robots playing uh, soccer. It could be, you know, business in agreement. It could be doing anything. But it actually, so, so it applies to all the examples we had before, but it applies even more generally. For example, um, consider a legal system and assume that what we require is that a judge will only send me to jail if I committed the crime I'm accused of, okay? Then 
knowledge of precondition says that the judge could only send me to jail if she knows that I committed the crime. Okay? In reality, we can't satisfy the latter, and so we don't satisfy the former. But any system that would satisfy this specification would have to satisfy that. Um, in uh, biological systems, suppose, <coughs> you know how a jellyfish, a medusa, operates, you know, the, they can sting you if you go in the water and you touch them. Well, <coughs> it, jellyfish actually doesn't sting anything that touches them. For example, a jellyfish will not sting a rock, it will not sting its other limb. So there's a set of things that it doesn't uh, sting. So if the jellyfish satisfies that it can only sting something if this object is not a rock, then it has to know that it's not a rock. And the jellyfish knowing in this case is that part of its protocol that knows, which means within the cell that contains the arrow, the poisonous arrow that is sent, in this particular cell there's a process that determines if it stings or not, and that process should be in a state guaranteeing that it's not touching a rock. And in fact, if you go in and study the cells of jellyfish, there's a very elaborate process of friend or foe figuring out whether or not to sting, because the cell, once it fires the arrow, that's the last thing it did. The cell is dead, so it's a, an important uh, decision. OK, uh, there are other examples. I want to uh, spend a few minutes now uh, <coughs> giving an example of how we can uh, apply the knowledge of preconditions principle to the design of an efficient protocol. But first, are there any other questions? Yes? No, I'm going to talk about uh, consensus, which will not be Byzantine, will, be, will have failures. But if you have liars, then uh, the fact that someone tells you something does not, I mean, you, you can maybe know that I said I'm going to be uh, in time for the talk. But uh, that, that you might not use that in order to conclude that that's, in fact, what's going to happen. So the fact that I send you, I can send you a message, you know, I'm going to give you $1,000 after the talk, and maybe you can say, OK, if he said that, for sure he's not going to. So you, you might know what you conclude might not be the text of messages. But I'm not assuming anything about the text of messages here. If you have an indistinguishable state where something happens, then you don't know its complement. So this applies in Byzantine systems, systems without failures, and so on. OK, it's really universal. So I'm going to talk about now about the, the binary consensus problem, a very uh, famous, well-known uh, problem in distributed computing uh, in its uh, simplest version, you're going to hear about uh, <coughs> other related uh, problems, Byzantine agreement, whatever. Uh, soon, there'll be more sophisticated versions of a similar thing. So here, we have n nodes in the system. They are connected via a complete graph. Each of them starts with a value either 0 or 1. Uh, I'm going to assume that they communicate in synchronous rounds, so in every round, Every process sends messages to other processes, receives messages, performs an action, and then there's the next round. They all start at time zero. There's a global clock. They know what the time is. And uh, I'm going to make two standard assumptions. One is that there's some bound on the number of failures. Failures can only be crashing failures in this example, so a process behaves according to the protocol up to a point where it can crash, after which it does nothing. In the round in which I crash, I might be able to send some of my messages 
and maybe some of them will not be delivered. Okay? And I'm going to assume that in the analysis that processes in every round send all the information they have, but that's just uh, for purpose of exposition. So the binary consensus problem in this case is to devise a protocol that will satisfy three conditions. One is that every correct process, every process that does not crash, has to decide on some value, some either on zero or on one at some point. The second is agreement. All decisions <coughs> have to, by correct processes have to be on the same value. And the third is that <coughs> if uh, that you can only decide on a value that is one of the actual initial values. So if everyone started with zero, we have to decide zero. And if everyone started with one, we have to decide one. And if there were some zeros and some ones, then the specification does not force us to either, but it does force us to be in agreement. So we have, we have to decide on the same value. But if we didn't start with all with the same value, then we can the protocol can choose what to do. OK? Is this, uh, how many people have heard of the consensus problem? OK. So the validity, problem, the validity condition here says that uh, <coughs> you can only decide on a value v, say on 0, if someone started with 0. This exists. v means some initial value was v. And so what we have seen by knowledge of preconditions is that a necessary condition for deciding on 0 is knowing that one of the values is 0. OK? Right? This is an application of knowledge of preconditions. Good. So let's think about how a process can know there's a 0. Well, you can know there's a 0 if uh, you know, at time zero, you started with a value of zero. And otherwise, you can know there's a zero if you receive a message chain from someone that has a zero. And from that point on, yeah, I assume that you don't forget your state. This would be the full information assumption. You will know there's a zero here, and you'll know it from here on. Okay? Those are the ways in which you know that there's a zero. OK? So now let's ask, how can it be that you know, you know there's a zero? So there's, think of an execution. So, OK, so take a step back. In these pictures now, this is a single execution. And each one of the lines here is an individual history. OK, this is process 1, process 2, process 3, up to process n. This is not before a single line was a, a whole execution. And here, it's just the timeline, the, the local history of a particular process. OK, so you can know, h can know there's a 0 if, at time 0 if he starts with this value. And uh, j can know there's a 0 if he receives a message chain that started from someone with a zero. This message chain tells it there's a zero. Good. So now let's ask, so this is just a partial picture of, of this execution. So suppose at some point, at some time m here, <coughs> you know there's a zero, and I don't know there's a zero. How can that be? Well, uh, I'm assuming that Everyone sends a message to everyone in every round, telling them all the information they have. So if we are both still active here, we haven't crashed, I've received a message from you at this point. If I don't know there's a 0, then you yesterday didn't know there's a 0. OK? This is time m. This is time m minus 1. How could it be that you know that there's a 0 now? You received a message from someone who knew that there was a 0. OK? Good. 
Now, <coughs> what does that mean? You know there's a zero, and I don't. It means that this J prime who sent you this message crashed in this round, and that's why I didn't receive a message from J prime. Okay? So in the last round, someone had to, uh, someone who knew yesterday there was a zero had to crash uh, and tell you about the zero. Now what happened yesterday? Well, there was someone who knew there's a zero, and there were two you know, who didn't know there's a zero. So the same argument applies for time m minus two. So if we zoom out for a minute, we can continue this, uh, <coughs> this reasoning and see that in order for you to know there's a zero and for me not to know, there has to have been someone who started with a zero, crashed without telling me, told someone else, who then crashed without telling me. You see a pattern. Now that's why they never tell me. They know, they all know about the zeros, but I don't get to know. Okay? So, what we conclude here is that uh, if you know there's a zero and I don't know there's a zero at time m, then at least one fresh process had to crash in each round up to now, so that at least m crashes have to have occurred. Okay? Good, so at least there was a prize for keeping me out of the picture. Okay. So what that means, if we have a, a, a bound of t on the, an upper bound of t on the number of failures at time t plus 1, we can't have this because to have this would mean that t plus 1 guys crash. So either everyone knows there's a zero or no one knows there's a zero. And that's why there's a simple um, protocol for uh, consensus which goes at time, <coughs> well, we, we follow the full information protocol in every round. At time t plus, one, zero, t plus 1, if I know there's a 0, I decide 0. And if I don't, I decide 1. It's guaranteed that at time t plus 1, my decision will be the same as that of everyone else who survived up to this point. Okay, this is a well-known uh, protocol, but this is just a cute way of, of looking at it. Okay. <clears throat> now, if we look at this, we can say, well, if I see a zero, I know that if I ever survive to time p plus one, I know what I'm going to decide. So I may as well decide right away. Okay? So, I can modify this protocol P0. This, the zero here is because we're trying to decide zero before we go to decide one. So I can modify this and say, in any case, if I know there's a zero, I can decide zero. Otherwise, if time t plus one, I don't know there's a zero, I decide one. OK? Great. Now, here all decisions. Before all decisions happened at time t plus 1, here they all, decide, they all happened by time t plus 1. So it's, it's not a big difference. If we look at, at the, uh, the <coughs> decision time, well, in the protocol p0, everyone decides at time t plus 1, regardless of what the initial values are and how the environment behaves. And in the q0, this modified one, on an exponentially small number of executions will decide at time t plus 1. On a tiny portion, will decide at time, at time between 2 and t plus 1. And uh, basically, in almost all of them, will decide after one round. So the, the actual uh, performance is very different. OK? All right. So uh, this uh, slight modification is much better. But uh, I want to see if we can do even better than that. So suppose, so one thing we're doing in Q0 is that at the first time at which we can ever decide 0, we're deciding 0. Because you can't decide 0 before you know there's a 0. 
Okay, so decisions on zero are as fast as possible. Suppose that as a protocol designer, what I decide to do is I decide that this is going to be my rule for deciding zero. Let's see how I can improve the rule for deciding one. Remember, the agreement condition says that I can only decide one if nobody decides zero, right? Now, <coughs> um, in particular, this means that I can only decide one if nobody is currently deciding zero or has decided. So if no one currently knows there's a zero, because if anyone knows there's a zero, either they decided zero or they're going to do that. Okay? So by the knowledge of preconditions principle, I can only decide one. A necessary condition for deciding one, assuming that this is my rule for deciding zero, is that I know that nobody knows there's a zero. Okay? So how can I know? So first of all, you see, when we looked at, uh, at the old uh, protocol, the, the rule was, well, if you know there's a zero, decide zero, and the time t plus one, Otherwise, it's nice. so knowing there's a zero is just you've seen a zero. It was fancy notation for receiving indication of a zero. But here, knowing that nobody knows a zero, that's a harder thing to do. So what do you do when you find a hard? So, so this is the protocol we want to uh, implement. If you know there's a zero, decide zero. If you know nobody knows there's a zero, decide one. Uh, here you're deciding zero as fast as you can, and you're deciding one as fast as you can given the decision on zero, which is great. Now you don't know, but this is not really a protocol. This is all in, I mean, this is if you've seen a zero, but what is this? So what do you do when you find a problem? You don't know the solution. You go into the web, and you find that there are experts who already know how to do this. For example, there's a guy who says that it is his business to know what other people don't know. So you send them a message saying, you know, I have this problem, I want to solve, you don't get an answer, then you realize that this claim was made a long while ago, and maybe this guy wasn't around so much, so you have to go and do it yourself. So, <coughs> if, if the web doesn't give you, if Google doesn't solve it, machine learning will, right? But you know, before the days of machine learning, we had to solve the problem. OK. So uh, now I'm going to make, uh, I'll show an analysis of how we could do this. And we'll uh, pause for questions. And then we'll uh, go and look at another application. So how can we solve this? Well, how can it be that you know <coughs> there's a zero, and I don't know there's a zero. Well, this can only happen if there was a message chain from someone with a zero to you, and I've never heard from anyone along this path. So I can, <coughs> from the point of view of uh, process i at time m, we can divide, partition the <coughs> all the, the processes at different times into three states. Ones, the blue ones are ones who, where I at time M has, knows exactly what the local state was. The blue ones are ones that I has seen, okay? There are some for which I has proof that uh, the process crashed before this given time. So for example, I didn't hear from process H at time zero, so I have proof that process H sent nothing at time one, two, three, and so on. So these are all, he was completely dead. I'm sure that he was completely dead here. What happened here? What value process H had? I don't know. And the same for this process and, and this process and so on. So <coughs> these a process where I'm not sure if the process was alive or not, and I don't know what its local state was at that time, I consider a hidden process. And the only way 
in which <coughs> so this is considered, I call this a hidden path, a path of uh, processes, time zero, one, two, and so on, where I don't, they're, they're neither uh, seen nor known to be crashed. I, that is, they're hidden, is called a hidden path with respect to process I at time M, with respect to this node. So it's easy to prove that there is a hidden path with respect to I at time M if, it, if and only if I does not know that nobody knows there's a zero. If there's a, a hidden path from me, then pessimistically thinking, this could be a zero, it could have passed through the whole path and reached you now. So if there is a hidden path, I don't know that nobody knows. Conversely, <coughs> If I don't know that nobody knows phi, that is, I think it's possible that someone knows there's a zero. That is, I think it's possible someone knows there's a zero, there must be a hidden path. OK? So when do I know that nobody knows phi? If there is no hidden path. What does that mean? For some time between time zero and the current time, I'll know there is no question mark. OK? I'll know they're either blue or cross. OK? And so uh, that's what I need to check. I look at my view of the, of the past, and if there's a, some time 7 on which I, I can see everything or have proof that they're dead, I know that nobody knows phi. And if for every time point there's a hidden node, I can't. So we've uh, implemented. So that's the way to implement the protocol, so essentially implementing this opt zero is if you've seen a zero, decide zero. Otherwise, looking at the information you have about the past, if there's no hidden path, then you decide one. OK? And what one can show is that opt zero strictly improves on our improved protocol Q0. There is no way you can strictly improve up zero. And moreover, we can show that even though I designed this assuming the full information protocol where messages grow exponentially, you can implement that with messages of size t log n. So life is actually simple and efficient. This is joint work with Amanto Castaneda and uh, Yanai Goncharovsky. And that's. <coughs> finishes the illustration of how we can use the knowledge of preconditions principle to uh, get an efficient solution to a well-known pro problem. This problem was considered starting from definitely 82. And this was the first unbeatable uh, solution uh, for the protocol, for the problem. Questions at this point? Yes? Are you assuming No, you, if you infer something that's not time dependent, like the time is seven, you, something about the run, uh, I mean, your local state will be part of, uh, you know, you, you have complete memory of your past. So if you concluded something, it must be true, and uh, you will always have that in front of you. Okay, so there's, there is monotonicity. The, the answer is yes, but that's, that's uh, <coughs> an outcome of the definition of knowledge on the one hand, and the assumption that we're following the full information protocol, so your uh, information only grows. You never... Uh, lose any information that you had in the past. But that's assuming that the logic we are assuming is inferring monotonous. So I'm uh, the logic. I'm, I'm not doing inferences in the logic. Everything. Uh, my definitions were essentially semantic definitions. Okay. What is true? So what you know depends on what is <coughs> what follows from your local state 
period. It's not, it's not something that we use a logic in order to derive inferences proof theoretically. Okay? This is sort of mathematically, semantically the case. Yes? In this example, I'm, I was assuming synchronous communication you saw in the pictures. We have time m, time m plus 1, and so on. That was the model here. What? You can relax that condition. The definitions of knowledge are fine. The, the solution here, and you can't solve consensus if you assume the system is asynchronous, for example. And I'm going to talk about asynchrony in a little bit, so I mean, when, when we go on. This example was purely, definitely, in the synchronous round by round communication model. You can reason about knowledge with asynchrony, and we're going to do that in a minute. Yes? Well, it's not that it's necessary and sufficient. I mean, because it's, um, let's go here. Here, we, uh, originally we said if you know, I mean, in, in Q0, if you know 0, you decide 0. Otherwise, at time t plus 1, if you don't know 0, you decide 1. Uh, here, you know that nobody knows there's a 0, implies that you don't know there's a 0, and that you wouldn't know it at time t plus 1 either. But, um, but this is not necessary and sufficient in the sense that there are other um, <coughs> unbeatable protocols. You can't strictly improve on this one. But you could say, have a protocol that prefers one. Or you can have a protocol that would try uh, to decide on the majority of the values that it sees. No, here we. Oh, no, do, dominates means in all, in every, for every behavior of the environment, uh, I decide, so uh, the dominating protocol decides at least as fast as the, the other one. So op zero dominates Q zero means in every execution, whenever Q zero, a process decides in Q zero, is al already decided in up zero, either then or earlier. So it's like better, faster. OK? OK, good. So uh, <coughs> now I'll uh, spend the next uh, 25 minutes or half hour uh, talking about how we can use knowledge to understand coordination in time. So one thing. Uh, we can show is a connection between knowledge and ordering actions in a distributed system. And one thing that I didn't mention, when we define knowledge, um, we defined when a process knows a fact. Once you have this definition, you can talk about when, when uh, two knows that one knows something. So now one knows that the maximum is 100 is a fact. And there's a question of when does 2 know that this fact holds. OK, so we can, we can iterate the knowledge operator using the same definition. So I'm going to say that given a system, a set of runs R, I'm going to say that a sequence of actions, alpha 1 up to alpha k, alpha 1 is an action of agent 1, 2 of agent 2, and k of agent k, are ordered in R. If uh, a necessary condition for performing, uh, for, for J to perform his action is that J1 has already performed, J minus 1, the previous, the one, the predecessor, the one, the, the action before it already happened. Okay, so if we denote by Ti the time at which alpha i occurs, then 
they are considered ordered in R if in every execution Tj minus 1 is earlier than Tj. And uh, we can prove, I'm not going to prove here now, <coughs> is that if we have a sequence, an ordered sequence of actions in a system R, and the first action has a necessary condition, so you can only, one can only perform the first action if some event E occurred, then for each one of the actions, for each action alpha J, J can perform a necessary condition for J performing alpha J is that J knows, that J minus one knows, and so on, that one knows that the action occurred. Okay, so in fact, uh, we have a connection between ordering actions and nested knowledge here. Okay, what does that give us? Well, okay, there's a, a famous uh, early paper by Chandi and Mizra that uh, talked about knowledge in asynchronous uh, systems. And it basically says that suppose we have a, an asynchronous system, a set of runs of a protocol in an asynchronous model. If in a particular run, at some time, one does not know phi, and at a later time, two knows that one knows phi, another way of thinking of this is if two knows that there was a change in one's local state, then there must be a message chain in R from <coughs> uh, time zero, a message chain from process one to process two in R that starts after time zero and finishes by time T, T1. So a message chain is just a chain of messages. So it's a message from one to someone followed from a message from this process to someone else and, and so on, which ends at process two. And in order for two to know that there was a change in one that happened after time zero, there has to be a message chain from one to two. I can't know in an asynchronous system, the only way I can learn something about you is if there's a message chain from you to me. Okay, or the only way I can know that you perform an action, for example, is if after this action, I receive a message chain from you. And uh, they generalize this to show that the only way that we can get nested knowledge is um, <coughs> if there's a message chain that goes from one to two, from two to three, and so on up to m. So if phi is that some event occurred, which was a necessary condition for one moving, then a necessary condition for process m to move would be that there's a message chain that started after one actually heard that this event happened, went from <coughs> one to two, and then here in this, in this example, it's uh, for three to know that one knows, that two knows, that one knows phi, then we would have to have a message chain that goes from one to two, one to two, to one, to three, and um, so that's early work, 1985, 86, by Chandi and Mizra, beautiful paper. Um, and what it means is that in order to order actions in an asynchronous system, you have to, the only way to do it is by messaging, okay? Because we've related ordering to getting nested knowledge and nested knowledge to message chains, and that's how you get this. Okay, so I'm gonna, next to last task is to take this and to try to uh, generalize this to get some insight for the interaction between time and coordination in uh, distributed systems. So I'm going to look 
rather than an asynchronous system, I'm going to look at a model which we call the clocks and bounds model. So assume that the, ne the network graph <coughs> is, uh, OK, we have a directed network graph. OK, uh, every channel has a source and a destination. We have a global clock. Everyone knows what the time is. And uh, for <coughs> message transmission along a single channel, we have an upper bound on how long messages take. So for every, um, <coughs> for every edge in the network, for every channel, between i and j, there's some uh, finite bound such that delivery uh, along this channel will take between 1 and this bound. OK, so for every channel we know from me <coughs> to uh, Valerie, every message arrives within three steps. And to Kevin, every message arrives within seven steps. And from Kevin to Lorenzo, in one step. Okay, so we have for every channel we we have some bound, and uh, this is the, the the way the model looks like. Okay, we have a bunch of of nodes, and uh, for every channel we have a, a bound. Well, forget the infinity doesn't matter here. Messages from Susan to Alice take at most nine. Susan to Bob at most four, and so on. Okay, that's the model, and. Um, I'll get back to these uh, nice slides later. Yeah. Yes. There was one, one edge that said infinity, but I thought everything was less than infinity. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you could have it less than equal infinity. I mean, it's, so forget infinity okay, doesn't matter. I, I would just describe yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you're right. Uh, but it shouldn't be less than equal infinity and, and the picture with infinity. But it could be. Uh, less equal infinity rather than less than infinity. OK. So I want to look at, uh, consider the following uh, example. We have uh, three agents, uh, Alice, Bob, and uh, Charlie. Uh, wait. I have, OK. All right. So um, I have a. a a slide missing. OK, so I'm going to consider the following puzzle. We have Alice, Bob, and Charlie. There are three uh, nodes. And they, want, and, and they have the following problem. Alice has received a check from uh, Charlie that she wants to cash. However, Charlie has bad credit. His uh, bank account uh, has been. Uh, shut down for now, and Bob is uh, the, uh, the banker who can activate the Charlie's uh, account. OK? So uh, what they need to coordinate is that first, Charlie will uh, deposit some money in his account, and then Bob will uh, activate the check. And finally, uh, Alice uh, will activate the account. And finally, Alice can go to the bank and cash her check. Okay? Uh, but we want to, to have these actions happen in this order. First, Charlie deposits. Then Bob reactivates. And then Alice cashes the check. If Alice cashes the check before Bob reactivated the account, she will get a fine. She doesn't want to do that. If Bob reactivates before Charlie uh, uh, deposited the money, then he might get fired because his job is actually to check that things work. OK? So now, uh, these slides, if I get to. So now, with clocks, the, the problem of ordering uh, is simple. We simply tell Charlie to uh, deposit on Sunday, Bob to reactivate on uh, Monday, and Alice to cash on Tuesday. This is an example from Israel. Banks are open on Sunday. 
uh, but not on Friday, so it's not as if uh, life is so much better. But uh, in fact, this is not really a, a good uh, description because in this puzzle of how to uh, <coughs> order these actions, uh, Charlie is not someone you can actually rely on. He's not going to follow the protocol. That's why, you know, his uh, <coughs> his account is, is not uh, has been deactivated. So we should uh, th think of Charlie's deposit as a spontaneous action, an action that uh, depends on it's an external input. It's the adversary that will do this, and once Charlie's action is a spontaneous action, we actually uh, need information flow in order to notify Alice and Bob of the deposit and to allow them to coordinate. So one way we can do this is by using a message chain. So once Charlie deposits, he sends a message chain to Bob. When Bob receives a message, he activates. Assume this happens instantaneously. And then uh, another message chain from Bob to Alice. When she receives it, she cashes her check. Fine, this works. And it's all good and well. <coughs> now, let's consider, uh, but, but that's not making any use of the fact that we have time. We have time bounds, and maybe we can use them. So let's look at two scenarios. So suppose that Charlie deposits a sufficient amount at time t, and he sends proof of, uh, uh, of the fact that he deposited to Alice and Bob. Assume in this example that uh, Bob receives it at time t plus 2 and activates the account. But the bound on this channel is 10. So in fact, the message arrives after 2. But it could have arrived anywhere between 1 and 10 steps after. OK? So in this case, if this is the bound, it's guaranteed to arrive after 10 steps, then Alice can go at time t plus 10 and cash her check. OK? So we actually guarantee that these three events will happen in this causal order. What's interesting here is that we did that without uh, any communication between Bob and Alice. Okay? This is guaranteed because Alice, when she knows that Charlie sent Bob a message time t, she knows it will reach him at t plus 10, so she can go and cache at t plus 10. So we don't need a message chain as we did in the asynchronous world because we have these time bounds. OK, second scenario. Second scenario is similar. Charlie deposits, his time, uh, deposits the money at time t, sends a message to Bob, Alice, and now also Susan. The bound here is 10. So Alice, when she receives this message, she knows at time t plus 10, she can cash her check. But now Susan is actually a friend of Alice and the boss of Bob. So she, so, OK, Alice knew that at time t plus 10, she can go and cash. Alice goes and sends, relays this information. Hey, Charlie deposits the money uh, both to uh, Bob and to Alice. And suppose that Alice receives this at t plus 8. Then uh, she can. <coughs> She can immediately, if the, the bound from Susan to Bob is 4, she knows that, sent, that Susan sent at t plus 3 a message along this channel. She can go and immediately cash her check. So what we see in this example is that information about when things happen can allow us to improve and to perform the action faster. Okay. So uh, basically, she's guaranteed, even though it actually happened at t plus 5, she's guaranteed it would happen by t plus 7, definitely by t plus 8, so she can go and cash her check. So <coughs> let's take a slightly 
uh, higher level view of this, we have uh, our bounded, uh, our labeled graph with uh, the bounds. Let's define uh, dij to be the shortest, the length of the shortest path between i and j in this graph. And we can say that <coughs> there's a bound guarantee between i at time t and j at t prime if t prime is later than t plus the shortest path between i and j. What this means is that there's enough time from time t to t prime to guarantee that if i sends a message to j at time t, it will reach j at time t prime. OK? So let's look at this example. Um, let's look at our example now um, using message chains, using message chains and time guarantee. So the first execution looked like this. Charlie at time t sent a message chain. Message chains will be squiggly arrows. It reached Alice by time t plus 10. And there was a guarantee between Charlie at time t and Bob at t plus 10 that the, the information would reach him here. That's what happened in the first execution. In the second example, we had a message chain from Charlie through Susan to Alice and a bound guarantee from Susan to Bob, Susan at time t plus 3, uh, to Bob at time t plus 8. So this was time t plus 8. And Alice could uh, cash or check here. Another way of solving the problem would be actually for um, <coughs> Charlie to inform Alice, Alice to send a message to Bob, wait for the bound between Alice and Bob, and then cash the check. And then it would look like this. OK, does that make sense? <coughs> and finally, uh, just doing Lamport message chains, we would have a message chain from Charlie to Bob, Bob to Alice. And formally, there's a bound guarantee between Bob at time whenever he receives this to Alice at any later time. So all of these actually have a similar structure. They're all instances of this picture. There's a message chain from Charlie at time t to Alice at time t prime, which is when she cashes her check, going through some node. It's possible the node is actually the original node, but in all other ones, it's some other node. And a bound guarantee from that intermediate node to Bob at time t prime. In this case, intuitively, Alice would know here that Bob received a message from Charlie. So she knows that Bob knows about the deposit. OK? In fact, we can prove that this is exactly the only way in which <coughs> two can know that one can know that something. So if we have a spontaneous event occurring at this node. And later, at time t prime, two knows that one knows that this happened, then this is only possible if there's this kind of structure. There's a message chain going from the event to process two, passing through some node that stands in the bound guarantee for which 2 has a guarantee information would reach 1 by time t prime. OK? So this is a theorem sort of generalizing uh, the message chain theorem from Chandy and Misra. And um, in fact, we can strictly generalize that and say that the only way in which we can have nested knowledge that some spontaneous event occurred at time t prime is if there's a message chain. So if we, we want m to know that m minus 1 knows and so on, that 1 knows that the event occurred, <coughs> this is 
only possible if there is a structure of this type, there's a message chain from the event through some witness that will inform one and pass <coughs> and through another witness that would inform two and so on and bound guarantees through all of them. So this is a bit much, this is just a, a straight generalization of this and what that means is that centipedes are the analog of message chains in a model in which we have clocks and bound guarantees. And centipedes are necessary for ordering actions because remember there's a connection between ordering actions and nested knowledge. So, um, any questions at this point? I'm wondering, I have, okay. So the, the last uh, part here, uh, which could fit into the time uh, allotted, but we're not going to uh, <coughs> go through the argument, is we've seen that uh, actions, you know, knowledge of preconditions, actions depend on knowledge. Ordering actions depends on nested knowledge. Now suppose we have actions that need to be simultaneous. Okay? Valerie and I need to perform each our respective actions and these actions have to happen at the same time. Well that means that Valerie performing action one is a necessary condition for me performing my action alpha two. And similarly my performing my action is a necessary condition for her to perform the uh, action. So we say that two actions are necessarily simultaneous if performing Valerie's action, I mean a necessary condition for performing Valerie's action is me performing my action, a necessary condition for me to perform my action is that she performs her action. Well, I'm not going to, well, okay, I'll do it quickly. Well, <coughs> this means that a necessary condition for uh, Valerie performing her action is that she knows that I'm performing my action. But for me, and the necessary condition for me to perform my action is that Valerie is performing her action, so that she knows that I'm performing my action. And so we can argue that a necessary condition for me to perform my action is that I know that Valerie knows that I'm doing it and we can extend uh, this uh, reasoning and basically show that when we're performing simultaneous actions, we have to not only know that each is performing it, we have to know that the other knows that we're performing it, and we have to know that they know, that we know, that they know for all levels. And so this is called uh, common knowledge. A fact is common knowledge if one knows, the two knows, and so on, for all levels that this happens. Let's defer uh, <coughs> the, the, the actual definition of common knowledge. Common knowledge, a fact is common knowledge if everyone knows, that everyone knows, that everyone knows, that everyone knows. And we can prove that if we have a set of simultaneous actions in a system, then if we have any fact is a necessary condition for one of the actions, then reaching common knowledge, having everybody knows that everybody knows and so on, that uh, the precondition holds is also a necessary condition. So if phi is a necessary condition for one of the actions, common knowledge of phi is a necessary condition for the action. So uh, the <coughs> connection between knowledge and coordination that I've shown, uh, shown one level we've proven individual actions depend on knowledge via knowledge of preconditions. Ordered actions depends on nested knowledge of preconditions and simultaneous actions depend on common knowledge of preconditions. So in fact when you want to solve a simultaneous 
coordination problem, you have to reach common knowledge, which is much harder, and there are results about that. So to summarize, knowledge of preconditions relates knowledge and action. Knowledge is defined in a model independent way. It applies very broadly. I mean, it applies to distributed computing, but also we can apply it in social science, life science, etc. It's useful for deciding efficient protocols, for analyzing coordination, and also for using that to design efficient protocols. Uh, we've used it uh, in the uh, design of uh, asynchronous uh, circuits and the analysis of asynchronous VLSI circuits. Um, and uh, one uh, important next step, one topic of current investigation is uh, what happens in the probabilistic case. So what are probabilistic variants of knowledge of precondition if actions should be correlated to conditions but not with probability one or not with certainty? And there are various subtleties there, but I think that could be very interesting and related to uh, probabilistic protocols, or notions perhaps like machine learning or all sorts of uh, uh, weakenings of deterministic guarantees. So with that, I thank you. <laughs>